Hi, everybody. I'm Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford Beach Volleyball, and you're watching or listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. I'm Alana Rennie of University of Arizona Beach Volleyball, and you're watching or listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. Hi, I'm Kate Privet of TCU Beach Volleyball, and you're watching or listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. You tapped or clicked in to College Volleyball Weekly on Viral Volley Media. Now here's your host, Rob Lamont. Hey, great day, everyone. And gosh, coming up so quickly is the 2023 Collegiate Beach Volleyball season. And as always, College Volleyball Weekly Beach Top 20-ish. I did that from the men's side, Top 15-ish, because we got to cover all the teams that are about to, to burst into that bubble of the rankings. Because in the end, do the rankings really matter? It's the teams that show up at the end of the season. So uh, with me, Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford, the uh, returner. Three uh, returner. Then we got Alana Rennie of Arizona, a two time returner. And we also have not only a well, you're kind of a returner, you're on season one when Charlie couldn't make it. Mads had you fill in for her. So we'll, we'll call this year one your rookie season, but not only that, double agent. So it's exciting. Florida State and currently TCU athlete, Kate Privet. <laughs> so Love the intro, but hey, I wanted to, to get our uh, listeners and viewers a sense of who you guys are. And let's start with the rookie, Kate Privet. Okay, um, my name is Kate. I'm currently a grad um, Jewett student at TCU. I did my four years of undergrad at Florida State, and um, I'm from Texas originally, so it's good to be back in my home state this year, and I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited for this season with you guys. And then let's jump over to Alana Rennie of Arizona. Yeah, uh, I'm a senior. I actually graduated in December, but, you know, season calls, so I'm taking a couple extra classes so I can uh, play for my last year and still undecided on a fifth year or not, so uh, we'll see uh, where my decision lies at the end of the season. Gotcha. And then our three-time vet, Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford. <laughs> yes. Hi, everybody. I am Charlie. Um, as Rob was saying, three-time veteran. It's always great to be back, and it's really fun to have fresh faces this year um, joining us. And yeah, I'm a master's student. I am in my ending bit with my career at Stanford. This is my fifth season and yeah, I'm excited, excited for my final season, a little nostalgic for my final season of College Beach Weekly, but really excited for this year. And, and obviously, Charlie, the, the seasoned vet, new to wear her school's uh, name <laughs> on her chest. Oh, wait, there you go. It's <laughs> for the gear, Kate. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and if you want to decorate the background, that's totally cool. <laughs> 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 Let's start off with uh, one of the most new piece of news, and that's the preseason ABCA Collegiate Beach Volleyball Poll. And wanted to get your you as the athletes take on what came out and thoughts on what the coaches are thinking, since it is the coaches poll. So let's start with our rookie, Kate. Um, okay, so I think that the poll in general, it's this right now. It's hard to judge just because it's new teams and. It's hard to think like, should we rank based on last year's performance or based on what we think is going to happen? So I feel like there's a little bit of both. Um, I think UCLA is a good one spot. They're deep. They only lost one player. Um, and then the rest of the poll, to me, it looks it looks pretty good. Um, I would say six through ten, like those are hard to hard to judge. Anything could happen and. Anything could happen with it, the whole poll, but that's my opinion. All right. Let's jump over to, let's let's go, Charlie. Let's break the pattern up a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm going to have to agree with Kate on this. I think that the poll is the best that it could have been. Honestly, like from a preseason ranking, from looking at it over the years when we've seen prior preseason rankings, I think that this one is the most similarly indicative to how, not only how teams finished last year, but to how we kind of saw teams playing out in fall. And I guess that helped a little bit that we had the eyes in fall with a little bit heavier preseason competition than we've ever had before. 
Um, but like Kate was saying, I think six through 10, and I might even expand that to like six through 12 expanded question mark. Um, I think there's a lot of room for upset. And I think that there's this season, as always, we're going to see a lot of mixing around in the polls. Um, and I think because of how deep the talent goes on every team this year, especially because we still have some of us COVID class members left. Um, I think that it's going to be a really fun year to see what comes. Let's jump over to Atlanta. Thoughts on the uh, top 20 poll? Yeah, you guys have kind of hit the uh, nail on the head. And I think it's 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 always going to be competitive and it's always fun to see how it mixes up and and everything. And we never really know how the year or the season is going to go. So it's just exciting to see um, what the coaches have thought of it. And I think it's also pretty accurate. You know, in years past, I've been like you, you, you get the preseason ranking and you're kind of like, huh, like not sure where that came from or you might be shocked about something. So I think the coaches did a very good job this year and it's, it's cool as um, to see some new teams starting out in the rankings already, like Washington, they they have made the, the top 20. So congrats to them. And it's just showing the, the growth of the sport and the competitiveness of it too. Good stuff. You know, I was actually looking at the poll myself and the question I, I posed to you guys is, is it right on or dead wrong? Let's go to uh, Atlanta. <laughs> um, well, I think with that, like kind of just going back on what I said, I, I don't think it's necessarily either. But if I had to sway <laughs> one way, I would say it's it's right on. <laughs> um, just in case your your poll, your coach is on the uh, committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, don't don't tune in, Steve. Um, no, but I think I think it's a it's, it's a good one. And I think it'll there there will be a lot of changes this year. And, you know, it's sports. It happens if you just pay attention to basketball this year. Like, I don't think anyone has really stayed consistent in any of the rankings. So I think it can go um, lots of different ways. Yeah. Are you, Kate, right on or dead wrong? I'd say it's right on. I like it this year. Um, there Obviously, there's room for movement, but I think it's pretty accurate to start out the, the season. Yep. And then Charlie. Yeah, I'm actually going to have to agree that I'd say right on. And I think it's funny because I don't think I've ever said that it's right on before in a preseason. I think I've always been like, I don't know about this one. <laughs> Um, but no, I think this year, again, like Kate and Alana were saying, like there is definitely room for upset and we're going to see things move around, but coming into this season, I think that this is as accurate as you could get for a preseason ranking for us, not really knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. So one of the, uh, pieces of data that I take a look at are the MOVR ratings. And, um, I think I sent my notes over to you guys, but out of the 40 top 40, only two of the players are not going to be active this year. So all these players are coming back to play this season. And the only ones that aren't coming back that we know of for sure, Ella Connor of Cal Poly and Brooke Nunaviller, who's playing indoor professionally. Besides that, the like who's in the top 10? Maddie Anderson's number one. Abby Van Wingle, two. Lexi Denneberg, three. Tanya Moreno, four. Brooke Van Sickle and Kaylee Glago of Hawaii rounded out at five and six. So, and then you got Megan Kraft at eight, Danny Alvarez at nine. It's insane that all these athletes are coming back, which means there's going to be some crazy brawls this year in collegiate beach volleyball. So I want to get your guys' take on the, the talent that's stuck around and what we could see this season. So let's start with you, Atlanta. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the talent is just constantly growing and the fact that these girls are staying around is just showing how much the sport is, is just getting more competitive and people want to stay and keep playing longer and getting the coaching that they're getting and, you know, always wanting to be in the fight every season and, and coming back is just such a, a fun thing. And, you know, not everyone's going to go professionally, but to see the talent at starting at, you know, the collegiate level is, is still really exciting. Yeah. How about you, Kate? I agree. Um, I think it's cool to see all the players, like Charlie mentioned, we're still in the, I think this is the third year of um, the fifth year. So the COVID people. So I think it's making the collegiate game a lot more intense too. Cause now you have all these freshmen coming in that have been playing for all this time and you still have your fifth years here. So it just raises the level of the game, which is really cool to see. Charlie, your take. Yeah, I think that it really just speaks to the depth of like beach volleyball as a whole. I think 
looking at all the teams, I think in in the history of the sport of NCAA beach volleyball, we've seen a lot of like powerhouse schools and we still have a lot of powerhouse schools, but I think even the depth of what schools I would label as powerhouses now goes a lot farther than it used to be. And I mean, looking at this list, we have a lot of schools that not nece- that aren't necessarily in the top 10 of rankings, but they still have these top players coming back or We have these top players from top 10 schools still there. And I think that it speaks to the strength of the top 10, but it also speaks to the strength of the sport in general, because we do see a much greater, like a much larger amount of depth than we've ever seen before, because of the fact that we have so many of these returners and so much just in general strength of programs. So it's awesome. Well, one of the things that we've been having that, or that we've been seeing this last two, two two-ish years, three years is the COVID year. And now the portal plays a major factor because I was looking at some of the top transfers. You have a couple of Pepperdine, former Pepperdines going to USC and LMU, a few Long Beach State athletes going to FIU, some LSUs going to UCLA, another Oregon to UCLA, um, New Orleans to FIU, um, Florida State to TCU. And, uh, you know, what does that do to those teams uh, in your guys' opinion? Let's start with you, Charlie. Yeah, I think I think it just adds to the strength of programs because you see this kind of transfer of goods. It's like you have a player who gets so much experience and depth and growth of themselves as a player and from one program and then they're able to take this kind of wisdom and share the wealth with a new program. It's it makes strong players even stronger and it also makes strong programs gives them the opportunity to strengthen in different new ways get new looks it's like you're getting a freshman to your team she you may only have her for one year but she also has four more years of experience than a freshman might have had and so it's one of those really cool things and that's to say it could be five years too we have some sixth years with the covid shirt and medical red shirt play coming in with that kind of wide range of experience we're seeing a lot a lot, again, greater depth than programs, but just wisdom of the game, I think is coming in. That's growing because instead of just having a large freshman class coming in, we have large freshman classes and also large transfer classes. Yeah. How about you, Kate? Thoughts on all the, uh, the transfers being that you are one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with Charlie. I think um, it's cool because you can kind of bring like some of the stuff you learned and some of the good parts of your previous program to your new program. And then you also get a new fresh perspective, new coaching. So you get to learn new things that you might've missed the past four years. So I, I think it's beneficial for the program and the player. And it's cool to see it. We've seen it the past couple of years, some of the grad transfers Um, last year at FSU, we had Brooke Bauer and she was a really big part of the team. So it's cool to just see the impact that they're making on the game and the team. All right. And Alana, close it out. Uh, yeah, I think I totally agree with both of you guys. I think it also can add to the the programs themselves by possibly like giving the coaches themselves um, like a new insight on maybe technique or a style of play that they want to change or incorporate into. I think it can build the players um, individual game and maybe their strategy or maybe like their previous coach had always wanted to teach them one thing and the way they were explaining it didn't work, but the the new style of coaching, maybe the way that they're explaining it or just like interpreting it just can click for that player. So I think there's a lot of different benefits that can come from it. Yeah. The other uh, thing that I got from the poll itself though, is I think there are teams that are on the rise, like you already mentioned Washington and, and not because you're on here, Atlanta, but Arizona has always been a team I've watched because they seem to uh, get some really good talent, you know, cherry pick from these areas that other people aren't going, but also they get some really good local girls like yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, also with like the growing nature of the sport, it, coaches are learning where to to pick and look for new players and things like that. And I think uh, transfers is a great option for coaches to look at and add to their team. And um it's 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 really fun to see the the growth of the sport in general. And also for you, Kate, I know you're a Texan, but you know even at the USAV Beach Championships in August, I was looking at a lot of the girls that were playing in the quarters and higher. There were Texas, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, which I thought was pretty insane. And you being a Texas product, I'm sure you're familiar with the scene. Yeah, definitely. Um, Texas 
always been good. When I was in high school, it was, um, I'd say it was definitely the second state after California, but I would say it's gotten even better. I think um, this past summer at the BVCA, I think it might have been the Mad Sand, which is out of Dallas, that won. So, yeah, it's really growing here in Texas. And we can't ignore Floridians. So, there, there are a bunch oh, yeah. of well, Floridians in there. I got to put that out there. So, um, and then Charlie, San Diego area seems to keep bringing the people up to uh, Wave, uh, Coast, Tamarack, and your club as well. Yeah. So it's actually kind of funny that you bring it up too, because Kate was mentioning from Texas, Kate and I played for sister clubs growing up. Um, so we both played for the 692 Texas and West branches. Um, and it was fun to kind of see that talent, like with clubs that are in completely different States. Um, it's also really fun to see kind of that depth, like grow throughout the country, because I feel like back in my day, <laughs> um, the talent, the talent, Pool was very strongly concentrated in California with some peaks in Texas, like Kate was saying, and peaks in Florida as well. But now we're seeing it, like you were saying, in a much wider range. I mean, I don't, I think with all of our current freshman class, we have six freshmen and we don't have two from the same place. We have six different freshmen and we have them from all over the US and worlds. We have two international freshmen. We have four from Georgia, Colorado, Hawaii, and California. And I think it's a really awesome testament to just kind of the width and the growth of the sport of beach volleyball and juniors because of the fact that we've never had something like that before. I think that my class was concentrated in um, everybody was from California except for we had one Virginian and now it's like we have one Californian and everybody else is from different places so I think it's a really really awesome testament to the game. Yeah well I, I did want to ignore the east coast teams that could be up there we mentioned uh, Washington and Arizona that are on the rise, but Stetson brings back some international players. You've got FIU with transfers, FAU, although they lost a pretty hefty number one pair in Mac Morris and Erica Brock, but they're still up there. Um, they're going to be up in that mix too. But, you know, with the way the poll is, I think it's going to be so tight in that, that ladder or that midsection there uh, all the way to the twenties. Mm -hmm. And, it's going to be, I don't know if they're going to cross paths because the composite schedule hasn't come out yet fully. So I don't see where everyone's going, but, you know, looking on paper and hearing what Stetson did at the East coast fall championships, they're one of those dark horse teams that you got to keep an eye on. So, and I don't know if, did, if, did you guys go to the East coast at all? Did any of you guys? Um, we, we traveled to Huntsville for the pairs championship and then we'll be making one East coast trip. We'll be going out to LSU uh, this year, but I think even looking at like powerhouses with the names of TCU, FSU, LSU, like those are still schools that are ranked super high, as well as our kind of like middle of the pack squad with FAU, FIU, Stetson, like you were saying, Rob. And I think it's a big testament to kind of those middle of the pack schools because we saw a lot of them at the national championship tournament last year. I mean, Georgia State had like the upset of the century last year. Um, and Georgia state is also ranked pretty high this year. So I think that the West coast it definitely has some strength, but the East coast is firing right back with an equal amount of strength. What I think is awesome is Georgia state comes in out of the ABCA poll at number eight, and it's behind the power of their five, four pair that goes out and beats on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love watching those two play. <laughs> the Angel and Bella Ferrari juniors too. So they got another year after this one. <laughs> they are a fiery pair too. I actually got the chance to meet them and play against them this fall. And I'd never really seen them live before. I've only just heard of how fiery they are and they are, they are a hoot and a half. I'll say. <laughs> well, let's um, go over to the other big piece of news, and that's the NCAA Collegiate Beach Championships change of format. It was a first round single elimination, and it go to the quarters and double elim from there. Now everything is single elim. And I've already talked to coaches about it because I had to do a piece for Volleyball Mag uh, that's going to be coming out in the next few days. And I've got a sense of what their take is on it, but I want to hear what the athletes think about it, being that you know, it's intense out there and it's high pressure. And so let's start with you, Alana. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, we just had that final expansion uh, last year of raising it back up to 16 teams. 
And I liked being able to kind of draw the tournament out a little bit longer and like see more of the championship actual tournament play happening. So I'm a little disappointed that it's going to be a couple a uh, few fewer games this year, but um, I think it'll really just put everything on the line. You know, every point matters really because you lose and you're done. So I think it'll be it'll be really competitive and entertaining to watch this this year. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point because I was talking to one of the coaches who said, if a team hasn't trained in the wind and the outdoors, they're going to be hosed. <laughs> so, Kate, thoughts on the uh, change of format? Yeah, I don't like the change of format. I think um, it was it was really fun to have the single limb first round, but I think that it should either be the same format as last year of the single limb first round and then double limb, or it should just be like a full single limb or full double limb 16 team tournament. It's already a short, I feel like beach volleyball is already a short season and now it's like only eight weeks. Shorter. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> uh, I, I wish they wouldn't have made it single elimination, but yeah, Charlie, your take. Yeah. I'm with Kate here. I kind of hate the new format. If I'm being honest, um, I have a pretty strong opinion on it because of the fact that everybody worked so hard to expand this bracket to 16. I mean, I know competing at the national championship in 2021, we were speaking and signing petitions at that time to like literally at the event, we were signing petitions to expand the tournament to 16. And I remember how big of a deal that was and how rewarded we felt because it had gone there. And my opinion here is that moving it to single elimination, it's awesome. I think this year, I don't think I'm pretty positive that this year we have 17 teams in the bracket because of the conference expansion situation. So yes, that's awesome that we have 17 teams competing, but at the same time, if you're going to single elimination at that point, our skill set is the skill set of all teams is so much deeper now that if we're going to move to that traditional national championship format with single elim, then I think the bracket needs to be expanded even further because we have currently no first round buys, which I think is an interesting format considering a lot of schools in all other sports that are growing the way that are the size of ours, they'll at least have a first round buy or they'll have a larger bracket that's 32 teams or 24 teams. And I think our sport is large enough and talented enough to where we could have a 24 team bracket, but we're not doing that yet. And I find that to be very interesting because I think that that's a handicap to where we're trying to grow the sport to be. Yeah. Well, if you look at the AVCA top 20 poll and you patch, if that were going to be the playoff bracket, it'd be FIU against UCLA, FIU being outdoors, playing in the wind in, in the you know Florida area, UCLA playing that sheltered area of Mapes Beach. That's a potential upset right there alone, just being in Gulf Shores. So, you know, but I also like the component of rising from the ashes and coming through the loser's bracket, or sorry, contender's bracket to... Uh, <laughs> add more drama you always have to pull for the underdog you know <laughs> I love it no I couldn't agree more and I think that the other thing too is like we saw some upsets happen like the best upset in the history of like the NCAA championships was when Stetson came in at number eight and upset number one USC um that was huge Georgia State was able to pull off some upsets last year like we've seen some awesome upsets which would be great like it would still be really cool if it was a single elimination format but again like it takes away a little bit because then what it's a, it's two day, it's a two day tournament, maybe three with you're playing a maximum of four games to win a whole national championship. I feel like beach volleyball, any tournament in the history of ever, we play more than four games. So I think it's funny that it's so much less for a national championship. Yeah. Great points. Indeed. Um, the, uh, other piece of news is you actually have one more conference, nine total conferences this year. It is the Sun Belt Conference, new for 2023. So that gives us the A Sun, Big West, Conference USA, CCSA, Ohio Valley Conference, Pac 12, Southland, WCC, and then finally Sun Belt. But uh, what do you guys think of the expansion? Is this the right time to do this, or should there actually be more conferences or less? We'll start with you, Alana. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of a little iffy on this uh situation. I don't know. It's with the the whole pack like how teams are getting bids also into the tournament in terms of if you win your conference and you kind of just get that in, or if you're nationally ranked and if there's a vote on it, I think conferences can show how strong a part of the country is. 
So I thought it's a little weird. I'm going to call this the school out GCU. I think it's a little odd that they went to the CCSA just because they're not really around any of those other schools. I had sort of maybe thought they would go to the WCC, but um, just um, interesting with that. But I think it could uh, be more competitive in terms of conference championships and actual conference tournaments and could uh, bring a little bit more, more action and maybe more recognition to the sport too. Yeah. How are you, Kate? Yeah, I think it, I like the expansion of more conferences just because um, I think it is growing the sport and it's you have conferences popping up in like geographical areas that normally didn't have beach volleyball. So then it'll bring players from those areas to collegiate. So I think it's really cool to for growing the sport. I think expand, expanding the number of conferences is really important. Yeah. And about you, Charlie? Same here. I think that for the growth of the sport, expanding the conferences is super important. I think that it will be interesting to see in these kind of growing years, how we can get these automatic qualifiers from the conferences in the national championship at the same level as some of these historical powerhouse conferences. But I also think that again, like Kate was saying, for the growth of the sport, it's completely necessary. And like, we need all of these conferences. We want to see the sport continue to grow And if a school has no motivation because their conference doesn't have or doesn't have an option for a beach volleyball, like to have beach volleyball, what's their point in sponsoring a beach volleyball team? So I think with the addition of more and more conferences, we'll see more and more schools adopting beach volleyball as a sport to their school. Yeah. Alana, you actually brought an interesting point that I didn't even think of was GCU going to WCC. Uh, it almost it sounds like it would have made more sense to go that way instead of making the CCSA this like gauntlet of purple teams or shades of purple teams. So, uh, <laughs> but you know what? In talking to the coaches, they're happy to have GCU there. But man, that is going to be one crazy battle for one spot in a tournament at the end of the year to get in the NCAA's. But then again, you have the uh, at large bids too, which there's always drama and disagreement, but. You know, as a sport grows, I think it'll be easier to pick those teams out, kind of like the NCAA basketball tournament. But it's exciting because you've got now, well, actually, all the teams in the CCSA could be pretty brutal. <laughs> Each coach had said that on any given day, they could beat the other team. And although summer teams are really deep and you have a lot of talent, it just takes one bad day. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, Charlie, you actually mentioned. Uh, the AQ situation. And I wasn't clear on that. I tried to find somewhere it was documented. Not every conference is going to get an AQ from what I understand. Is that right? Or is, or are they? Under my understanding, every conference was still getting an automatic qualifier was getting that AQ, but that the tournament had expanded to 17 teams. So there were still eight at large bids um, to be handed out from like a national qualifier basis, no longer the East coast and West coast representation, Um, But from the national qualifier wildcard bids have eight of those still with all nine conferences receiving automatic qualifiers that could potentially be for the 2024 season. But I thought that I had read that it was in the 2023 season as well. So would that 16th spot be a plan between the 17 and 16 to play the number one seed in the. uh, Yes, that was my interpretation of the rule. Yes. What is known as the chump game in NCAA basketball? (laughs) The play-in, the play-in in the, in the friendlier sport of beach volleyball. Hey, you get to play Duke in the first round. Awesome. <laughs> hey, got to gotta start somewhere, right? I mean, I right. think it's cool that we see even the mildest expansion of bringing in that one more team. It's like I was saying, I was like, bring in more teams. Let's make this bracket bigger. Let's make, let's see more upsets happen. Because I mean, we're not going to get to see it until we, until it's actually done. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, places I've been getting my data from, and if you're not following it already, viewers and listeners, you got to go check it out, beach.prospects.analytics on Instagram. They're putting up graphics. They're doing previews of all the conferences. They've done uh, WCC, ASUN, Big West, and CCSA so far, but they've also got other analytics there about most winning teams in you know top 20 and top 10 or versus top 10, uh, highest winning percentage outside the top 15. And So it's a great breakdown of information. And if you're a volley nerd like me, you're going to eat this all up. So (laughs) Um, let's go to our our next fun one, because I always love getting the athlete's perspective on which of their peers is tops in the game or ones to watch out for. Um, So let's go with uh, first our preseason favorite to watch. 
uh, for whatever reason. I'll leave it up to you, open-ended, and we'll start with, uh, let's go with Kate. My preseason favorite to watch is, this wasn't originally on my list. I had actually forgotten about them, but it's the Ferrari twins. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that they are so fun to watch. They're so athletic and they just like beat, they are 5'4", but they'll beat teams that are 5'11". They block, they pull, they do everything. And they're they're one of my favorite teams to watch. <laughs> How about you, Alana? Um, I'm really excited to see Meg Craft if she um, ends up staying in the States for uh, the season. You know, we didn't get to see her a lot over the fall because she was traveling. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to uh, watch her play again this year. All right. And then Charlie. Oh, this is a really hard question for me because I have a lot of people in mind. Um, I think somebody that I'm very excited to see because of the fact that this is the first time that she's actually dedicated to a, like dedicated her time to a preseason on the beach is Brooke Van Sickle. Um, so I think I'm going to stick with her of somebody to watch because of the fact that we've not, we've only seen Brooke coming off of an indoor season, her coming off of a full beach preseason. I think that she's going to be an even gnarlier weapon than she was before. Um, but then I think from like a standpoint of like, a like program to watch I'm actually really excited to see um what uh sorry this was blanking on me but it came back <laughs> I want to see what FAU does because FAU is so well known as the school that Erica Brock and Mackenzie Morris went to because they were such a powerhouse duo and they were so fantastic but I'm really excited to see kind of what FAU does because their they are deep in talent um, so I think that they're going to be a fun program to follow along with, you know, following Brooke Van Sickle, because I'm excited to see what she does this year. Oh, I, I love the uh, multiple name plug while saying you're only going to name one, though. That, that's a, <laughs> But you do have to mention FAU because they do have uh, top returners, Marquetta Savolova, Ellie Austin, Courtney Moon, Julie Hans. Oh, I'm going to butcher this one. Hansa Vachova. <laughs> so they're, they have a lot of foreign talent to watch for. Um, I'm going to add mine in there, and this is a tough one, but I'm going to go with a, a teammate of Kate's, and I think you played with her quite a bit in the fall, and that's uh, Lena Camille. Um, you know, I was following her on social and seeing what she's doing at the CEVs as a U19 for Ukraine. I'm like, oh, she's super thin. You know, it seems like her body still needs to develop. She came back heavier, stronger, and playing with Kate and dominating the net as a true freshman. So um, technically, it'd be a, a newcomer of the year, but yeah, I am so interested to see what she does on the court when she takes a sand in, in a week or so. So next one, uh, breakout or dark horse team. Let's start with you, Charlie. Ooh. Okay, so I don't know if they're classified as a dark horse because they're still ranked pretty solidly high. And they are our rivals. Well, actually, so I, I'm going to pick a couple. Like, our rivals are Berkeley. I think that we're going to be duking it out with them. Otherwise all. known as Cal for all you non, <laughs> non-Stanford non <But>, people. <laughs> but I will say that a team that we've always carried a pretty heated rival with, rivalry with is GCU. And I think Grand Canyon has a lot going for them this year. So I think that... I like it like almost pains me to say it because I have to root against them because they've been my rivals in the past, but I, I love what they've been doing. And you see Allie Hansen, she played with both Alanis Navas and Abby Hughes in the fall. And I mean, she took second at the Paris championship with Abby Hughes and they hadn't played in a tournament prior to that because Allie had been with Alanis. So I think that GCU has a lot to work with and they're going to be a very, very hard program to stop. Alana, didn't you guys play quite a bit, you know, in scrimmages in the fall against GCU? I mean, because you guys are you know, geographically within a couple Yeah, of pretty much every fall tournament, we at least saw them. So uh, got a lot of eyes on them this year. So <laughs> That's the rivalry. So that she's going to keep it at that right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we definitely have multiple rivals. So just kind of like an Arizona... <laughs> Arizona butting heads with that one. <laughs> well, how about you, Elena? Um, breakout or dark horse team? Um, I think I went 
uh, dark horse team as Washington. I did mention them earlier as being starting ranked number 20 this year, but I think, uh, you know, coach Derek Olson has done a really good job getting some good transfers and really developing that program into a really successful thing. And he, they're, they are a much deeper team than they have been in the, in the past. And I think they're really competitive and they have some great athletes and some great fifth years that have stayed in order to continue to grow their, um, their program. Yeah, Tegan DeFalco from your favorite GCU as a grad transfer to Washington. <laughs> I suspect that we'll see her at the ones or twos. So yes. good call. All right, Kate, your I break. I was gonna say GCU, but my second would probably be Cal. Um, I think that Cal has gotten some good transfers, some good freshmen. They were already like on the rise last year. So I think they're only gonna get stronger this year. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had some big upsets and had some big wins this year. All right. Next one, newcomer of the year. We're going to go backwards, Kate, Alana, then Charlie. Okay. Um, I have to go with Maggie Boyd. Um, I know that. Fellow Texan, by the way. Yeah, I know that she um, got the College Beach VB, but I've known Maggie since she was like 11, 12, and she was like a stud even back then. So it's crazy to see her in college dominating and I mean I'm not surprised and I know that she's gonna have a great season ahead of her so yeah I'm gonna have to stick with Maggie Boyd all right Elena I also had Maggie Boyd um I think just watching her over the fall it's like she doesn't look like a freshman she doesn't look like a newcomer she just she fits right in and she is able to hold her own and it's just really impressive and she she makes those plays or or has those shots or whatever that just makes people want to watch her and she's it's really it's really entertaining and, and it is fun to watch her yeah charlie i think i'm gonna round it out i had originally also had maggie boyd down i'll bring in another but i was gonna say kate i literally remember when you and i played in juniors together like i don't know six or seven years ago and maggie and gabby walker were playing in the tournament and they were the tiniest little like 11 year old sticks um, and we, you were like, those two are so good already. They're beating 14 year olds at 12 years old. Um, and so I remember them. And so now that they're in college at the same time, it's a little trippy <laughs> for me. Cause I'm like, wow, I remember feeling so old looking at them before. Um, but Maggie Boyd is a really talented player. So putting her name out there and then I'm going to give a little bit of a plug because I've gotten to see her really show some incredible amounts of talent being a teammate with her, with Ashley Vincent. She is a rock star of a player. And I think that she's going to be doing some really amazing things in her career, let alone this year. Um, so I'm excited to see where Ashley goes for our team. Good calls. I'm going to add mine in here. You know, I, you guys actually had the same ones I had, but I'm going to go deeper in because watching the fall competition, one athlete that really stuck out was Taylor Hagenau of Long Beach state. Um, she is strong she hits a heavy ball and she can do it all on defense. She's blocking. And, um, you know, I think they got first in one of the events here on the West Coast and made it to the Paris Championships and did okay out there. So, you know, still got to find the partner for her, but she definitely has a skill set to be successful. So with that, next one is top defenders. And it can be Alana Rennie or it can be Kate Privet if it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with you, Alana. Um, I am going back up to one of my rival schools, GCU with Alanis Novice. I think she's just so consistent and it's, she makes it look easy and effortless and, you know, her being able to represent her, her country, uh, Puerto Rico over the fall was a cool experience for us to see and see her succeed, um, with one of your teammates, Kate now. Um, and, um, she's, she's just fun to watch. You know, she, you, she see the passion that she has for the sport and um, it's, it's really, it's just fun. <laughs> All right. Let's go to Kate. I'm gonna have to go with my team of Tanya Moreno. She is just such a skilled defender, has all the shots, great, um, a great swing, jumps high, is fast and is really smart. And yeah, I think she's definitely a defender to watch out for again this year. So yeah, got to go with Tanya. <laughs> yeah, she reminds me a lot of Carol Solberg of Brazil. Uh, her playing style and her quickness and athleticism. So she's def definitely a fun one to watch as well. Charlie, you're a defender. 
So I'm not sure actually if she'll fully classify as a defender this year. She did last year though. So I'm going to count her and maybe add one more. Um, but Lexi Denneberg, she was a full-time defender last year behind Abby Van Winkle. And she was an, an absolutely insane defender, especially for it being her first time playing full-time defense. Um, so if she does step into that role as a full-time defender this year, I think that she's going to be an absolute weapon um, for UCLA. I don't know if she'll be blocking or defending this year though, and I'll get the opportunity to experience it next week when I <laughs> when we play against UCLA. Um, but then a true defender um, that I'm pretty positive will still be defending that I got to go to home with San Diego and shout out Delaney Maple. Um, she's always been just an incredible, incredibly savvy player. So I think that she will be somebody who's very hard to deal with this year. Yeah, that's a hard one for me to pick, honestly. But you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, withhold my comments back on this one because I feel like there's so many, and, and it's the blocker that the, the that determines the success of the defenders right now. So there's a lot of good plays. Like even in the fall, watching Alana step out there, even though I think you're a little injured, you had a, a brace and I, a ton of ice on, or is that your normal routine after? Oh, I've been wearing a brace since like fifth grade. It's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> But there is some good ball being played. And even Kate watching you play uh, behind uh, Lena was pretty insane. But she is also swatting a lot, too. So I don't know, maybe she's padding her stats and you weren't really working that hard at all. But I mean, still looked really good behind her block. Um, let's go uh, top blockers now. Let's start with Kate. <clears throat> um, I have to say my top blocker is Kylie DeBerg. I think that she was already coming on strong last year with minimal beach training. I think getting a whole nother summer, a whole nother fall under her belt. She's really going to, I think she's really going to break through even more this season. So I'm excited to see what she does. Yeah. She actually got some international travel and played with Haley Harward and now a recent USC graduate and an AVP professional. So, you know, and watching her play in the, I guess where they played in, in Ostrava, uh, they just had an Instagram live or Facebook live going and it is amazing to see how much she has grown in the short time she's she's played with Haley. So, yeah, Russ has got a good thing going there. I'm pretty sure she'll be at the number one swatting balls as well. So let's go to Charlie, top blocker. Yeah, I'd say Kylie was pretty probably much number one on my list, but I'll look for another one to add because <laughs> um, it's always fun to add more. Um, I'm going to say Danny on... Kate's team, Danny Alvarez. She, she's also, she's played defense in the past. She was telling me this fall because she played defense behind Lena, Kate's partner, um, due to Tanya being out for that week. But Danny's an incredible blocker and she does some very, very, very amazing things. Um, so I'm always impressed watching Danny. Danny and Tanya, they have incredible chemistry, but her block is a very, very formidable one. Yeah. And Atlanta. Uh, yes, I will also add another name because I too had Kylie DeBerg on my list. I think that's just a given, you know, um, but I'll go back to uh, Washington and just give him a little more of a shout out with Chloe Lorene. Um, I think she's just really consistent and has a really strong block, really knows how to read the hitters and is able to um, be a good partner and have good setting with her, her defenders as well. I think that's a really important tool that people kind of overlook as with blockers. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick one that we actually named a little earlier for another segment, but uh, in the finals of the West Coast Beach Championships in the fall, it was Tanya and Danny of TCU against um, Ali and Alanis of GCU. And it's Ali that really, really surprised me because, yeah, the block was important, but what she was doing defensively afterwards, like let's say a shot would come by, her reaction time to get to the ball behind her and pop it up and keep it in play or, or hit a, a third ball that was hittable for Alanis. I mean, she's definitely one to watch and yeah, she's blocking the balls, but it's also on defense, what she can do off the blocks. So I'm going to go with that one as a, my blocker. Um, Actually also, I have one more that I think that I <laughs> just completely left out. Um, Meg Craft. Seniority, huh? Adding the other one on there. I like it. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but Meg Craft of USC uh, we did not get to see her in fall, so she might have been a little bit less fresh on the mind because she was taking the semester off to go and travel and play internationally with Emily Stockman. But Meg is a fantastic blocker, and you talking about reaction timing and stuff with Allie reminded me of how quick Meg is moving around the block and just 
how incredibly fast she is. It's a really impressive skill. Yep. All right. Final one, the top overall athlete to look out for. If you're like a homer or just a fan say, oh gosh, I'm new to this game. Who should I be on the lookout for? Let's start with you, Kate. I'm going to go with probably Lexi Denneberg. Like Charlie mentioned, she can block, she can defend. So you kind of don't know what to expect. And she's also just a very physical athlete. You can tell she's physically gifted and she's very fiery and she's really fun to watch. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with Lexi Denneberg. <laughs> I'm just going to add that talked to one of their support staff they said that she's also a monster in the weight room so oh, I'm sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, how about you um kind of it's funny for the same reasoning as Kate but for the uh, different example as Charlie um I'm gonna go with Danny Alvarez I think you know the same thing she can defend she can block she's really consistent she just really knows where to place the ball what to do uh she's very comfortable on the sand and has a very high volleyball IQ. And I think that's really important and makes her a, a top athlete. Yep. And we'll round it out with Charlie. I'm going to piggyback on Kate and say Lexi Denneberg. I <laughs> had said it earlier. I'm a huge fan of Lexi as a human, as a player, all of it. And she's a phenomenal athlete and I've gotten to see and play against her a lot through the years. And she never ceases to amaze me with how much of just a raw, talented athlete she is. And yeah, like you were saying, like her being a beast in the weight room, like that does not surprise me at all because that girl is a beast. Like, I don't think there's anything that she couldn't do, really. Well, I see her bouncing balls over the backstop at Mapes a bunch of times. So I'm like, oh, I, I can't even get it halfway up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted, I know that we're, we've gone a little long here, but I wanted to give you athletes a uh, an opportunity to talk about the teams that you have this year for 2023. Is that okay? Or do you feel like you got to keep it on the down low until the first ball is served or are you guys okay with that? A mini, oh yeah. Wait, what I, do you mean? Like just uh, talk about your team, like uh, what you expect or yeah. no, yeah. you know what? The hesitation is volume. <laughs> so let's just leave it at that. <laughs> No, I, I I didn't know what you meant. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you meant like what teams we thought would like. I don't know. I don't know. No, just kind of like a mini preview of your team for 2023 is you know. So our, our listeners and viewers say, oh yeah, Stanford. Oh yeah, Zodell. Oh yeah, Kate Riley. You know, <laughs> or Alex Parker. Is like, oh, Sarah Blacker. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's talking about her. So yeah, are you guys up for it? You need pump your programs, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start with uh, Charlie then. Yeah, I mean, always here to pump up my program. You know this. Um, <laughs> I'm super excited for the season to come. I think that this is the deepest Stanford Beach Volleyball has ever been. I think we are seeing a bunch of talent in a bunch of different ways. Um, and I couldn't even name like just any like three people that are going to be the difference makers for our team because of the fact that every single girl who is out there who is working super hard is going to be a difference maker. And I think that that's going to come and show very quickly that Stanford Beach Volleyball is out to put our name out there this year. We're not just here to make it to the national championship. We're here to compete. And I think that it will be abundantly clear come this season that that's what we're here to do. Yep. All right. That's the Stanford Cardinal coming in at number nine in the preseason AVC 